Tyler, how are you, man? Yo, what's happening? It's uh, it's really good to finally do one of these. Um, I've done a bunch of these podcasts during the quarantine, and uh, I'm really excited to be chatting with you specifically. Yeah, it's great being in your bedroom too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is my bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's let's provide the viewer viewers with some context. Um, I met you through Rally. I joined Rally last July, and you were working for an agency at the time that was responsible for managing Rally's Facebook campaigns, right? But yeah. you weren't only working with Rally, you were working with um, multiple clients. So like, what's your background as far as like working with agencies and managing Facebook ads? Yeah, so when I first started with Rally at the older agency, it was, we started working March 2018 with Rally. And we started with very small budgets, like I think 200 bucks a day is what we were spending. And, uh, but we had probably 20 other clients that we were working with, anything from app installs, FinTech type things, uh, connect your bank account, round up, save, you know, a bunch of those. Um, then it was, you know, like rally where it was invest in, you know, classic cars to just regular e-commerce type stuff from mattresses to little old lady disposable diapers to walk in tubs, uh, just everything across the board, mortgage leads, you name it. So it was, uh, it, it was cool because I used to joke with people that, you could work at one company and you could just really refine your skills in that one vertical, or you can work with a hundred different companies over a year or two and just really get expert, uh, just expertise and all sorts of different uh, verticals. And so it's basically, you could devote yourself to ear, nose and throat and just be an expert in one little area and just know every single thing about it or right. be a veterinarian where you have to fix a dog a cat a bird a snake and a horse all in the same day and it just gives you so much visibility across everything to see you know what cats and dogs they all have this thing over here and you market an app the same way you market uh walk-in tubs for seniors and you know all sorts of different things so uh yeah like over the course of the past three years, I've probably launched, I'm probably getting close to a hundred different brands that I've launched. If I actually lined them up and count. Wow. And it's just like, you're, you're using a specific channel, Facebook, but then other um, digital channels as well to sell shit, right? Like, yeah. At the end of the day, you're selling something. You're the, the purpose of your advertising is to convince somebody to take some sort of action and Every single item has a customer journey. Everything has different value props. Um, and so you're just like building that, that, that skill. And you got, and even before running, working with that many different brands, which is crazy, you were doing real estate for a little bit too, right? Like yes. slang in real estate in, in LA. And I'm sure, like, how did that, how did that experience help you to kind of like launch your career in digital marketing? Yeah. So we left. Iowa, my wife and I, we moved out to LA after doing figure eights across the country for a couple of years. We settled in LA and I was like, oh, you know, my friends do real estate in Iowa. How much different could it be in Los <laughs> Angeles? The same. Yeah. So um, what I learned is I probably had better luck becoming an actor, <laughs> a famous actor than trying to get into real estate. Not that I didn't do okay. But it just took way longer than really I had the patience for. So I did it for probably four years, I think. And uh, by the time I decided to throw in the towel, I, I just sold like a two and a half million dollar house up in the hills and said, all right, this is my swan song. Right. I don't have the temperament for this sort of thing. But that was also because, you know, when I was struggling at the very beginning, I just read every single marketing, networking, advertising, copywriting book I can get my hands on just to find an edge. I probably read, I would say probably 
30, 40 books a year, just trying right. to learn anything, direct mail, uh, Facebook advertising. And then I would learn everything that had to be learned. How do you run a Facebook ad? How do you run a Google ad? How do you run the, the Google business stuff, SEO, you name it. I had to learn all these things, how to build websites and blogs and how to get organic traffic to blogs and how to get stuff picked up by other uh, media channels or, you know, like LAist, Curved LA, you know, like all the things here to just get in front of people. And so by figuring out how to market myself, it just, and just, that was kind of like my ear, nose and throat experience of just learning every single teeny little channel and every nuance with that. It just, I was preparing and I was getting ready for this career is basically the best way to say that. And so, uh, like after I just decided to throw my hands in the air and just say, okay, I'm done with this real estate thing. It was okay. Oh, hey, look, all those things I learned to market myself, I could do as that as a real estate agent. Everybody else. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, in reading those like 30 to 40 to, to 50 books, and I've been there too, like as I transitioned from sales to marketing, you come across some of the, the same things. Like, what are a couple of themes? And if you and if if someone was just like starting a career in digital marketing first, what are like three things you would just be like, you need to think about this? So one of the things that I think a lot of digital marketers, and it, it's funny that like, you know, people use all these words, digital marketing and yeah. you know, online, but it's, I, first of all, I think that there is a difference. There is marketing online and online marketing. Online marketing is CPMs and optimization and channels and media buying. That's, that's online marketing where you can just get into the weeds and there's plenty of those dorks that work at these agencies that just rattle off numbers. But yeah. there's also marketing online. It's regular old marketing just so happens to be on the internet. And if someone's going to get started, I would say that you have to learn what actual marketing is first and then figure out how to use that online. Cause a lot of people will just take any sort of ad, they don't care if the ad is any good, if there's any sort of connective tissue from the ad to the rest of the experience or to the person that's looking at it, does this make sense? And then, uh, so of course the ads don't work. And so what somebody else will do is, oh, we was the wrong audience. It was just the wrong audience. We'll just go find <laughs> somebody else just to deliver this bad ad to. Where if you think about marketing that just so happens to be online, it's looking at the ad, does this make sense? If you saw this ad, would you even know what the hell this company does? Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's just something it's, you, you know, you, you're not splitting the atom. This isn't rocket science when you're trying to get someone to download an app. So sometimes you do just have to get their attention, but it's, you have to go back to the basics. You have to know how to write copy. Don't just wait for it from the copywriter because the copywriter is so disconnected from the rest of the world also. So it's, you have to be able to know how to test stuff. And you also don't have to be Shakespeare when you write these things either, because you know, you might have some grammar Nazis that bug you, you know, write in the comments, but if it's working, you know, I call it writing in prose, you know, punctuate, put dashes wherever you want, capitalize what you want. Just make sure that it's coming across as spoken word because it's much different than written word. I think uh, a lot of the skill sets on the technical side of just like understanding the way to create a campaign and uh, target audiences and uh, run creative, like a lot of that stuff can be learned. I think those, those skill sets of like being a good copywriter, mm -hmm. that's something that even working with you, I got a lot better at because when mm -hmm. I started, like, uh, like I'll use uh, even like a example at Rally, like, Rally, a fintech platform we both worked on, um, allows people to invest in rare collectibles. Uh, sometimes I would write copy thinking about what I want the user to do rather yeah. than like, what does the user actually want to do? Mm -hmm. And it's like, if you call an ad and say, invest in rare collectibles, like you would come and be like, well, why do I want to invest in rare collectibles? Yeah. And that kind of mindset shift of like, okay, basically ads can just be like an instructional guide almost of like mm -hmm. how to use this product. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's, 
it's funny that we try to just write an ad, oh, download the app, connect your bank account, and do this. Sometimes that works. It's called yeah. NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, to where if you just tell them or tell, show them the one thing you want them to do, they'll do it. Like um, in the Harmon family, we have a saying that nobody goes anywhere physically until they first go there in their mind. So I think that there's a lot that you can do with that. <laughs> but on that same token is I, I used to run ads, uh, B2B lead generation for this analytics platform. And they would try to make me run ad copy that says, sign up for a free needs analysis. I was like, I need a needs analysis. Like I need another hole in my head. Nobody wants to get on a call for a salesperson to pitch them. There's no value in there. Nobody wants that. I'd rather get my legs sawed off than talk to a salesperson so they can satisfy their needs. But it's, it's like the old Zig Ziglar quote. I'm not giving you this big stack of money for this little stack of benefits. So it's why would I get on the phone with you? Oh, because I'm going to get access to this thing or get this, or I'm going to give you all these valuable things. And there's no benefit for the person that's actually selling this thing. Of course there is, but it's just don't even make them think that it's what I want you to do. In fact, when you are creating ads or landing pages or an entire platform for anybody, if it is too greasy, if the funnel's too greasy, like, and when I say greasy, I mean, there's grease and there's gravity. Yeah. What funnel. do you mean by that? So, uh, if you have this funnel and there's no grease, then that means that there is just resistance and there is friction everywhere. And if you have too uh, ungreasy of a funnel, nobody's going to be able to get them their way through it. But the other problem is, is if there is just grease, it's like a nice little slip and slide. If there's no gravity for them to go down, then they won't go down either. And so the trade-off really is if you have more gravity than you need grease, they'll, they'll figure out a way to get to the end of the funnel. So like if the need and the demand and you know, the desire to have this thing is better, but the checkout experience is just garbage, they'll still check out. They'll still yep. do it if it's good yep. enough. But if you have too greasy of a funnel and you click a button, it goes to the next page, it goes to the next page, and you just handhold them through the whole purchase process, a lot of times that's no good because you can't just drop them right on the end page and think that that's enough. A lot of times I've seen where if you finish step one, let's say it's like a tripwire funnel where you get them to get their lead information. Oh, try this free thing. You know, if you spend a dollar, you can get this. Oh, buy my book. It's eight bucks. And then all oh, of this seminar is thousand dollars. You should do that. Yeah. But if you just step them through each thing, they will bail. They'll just bail because it's exactly what you want them to do. But if you take them to a page where it looks like they have freedom of choice, maybe I'll click on the about us. Maybe I'll see what these offers are. Maybe I'll see what the testimonials are. If you let them do that, then giving them the illusion of freedom of choice, then they'll own the decision and they'll be able to, they'll, they'll actually do what you want them to do without them thinking that it's them being manipulated into doing it. So th th there's a whole thing there where it's if the value and you can give that to somebody uh, and make them own the decision where if you lay out all the pieces of the information, you let them connect the dots, then right. they'll own the decision because it's like, you know, you know, my wife, she'll say something and I'll ignore it. And then five seconds later, I'll come up with this great idea. <laughs> that was literally <laughs> what she said. And I like my idea a lot more than hers. So that's, it, it just works better that way. Yeah. I mean, we're human beings and we're flawed and, and we're irrational and mm -hmm. we make, we, there's a very specific way about how we make decisions. There's a lot of psychology there and there's a, and that's one of the most interesting things about working in digital marketing from my perspective is the way to kind of like leverage that psychology. The other thing that you mentioned, I mean, you said a lot there. Um, one of the, I think one of the problems a lot of people think it's, think about is like, okay, I'm going to send a bunch of people to this website and then they're going to convert. And like, that's my, that's my job. I'm going to run a campaign. I'm going to get a bunch of people to click this website and they're, they're going to convert. And mm -hmm. that's something that I think that we kind of thought about at rally a little bit where it was like, okay, we want somebody to become an investor or we want someone to become a purchaser. 
what's the journey that they go through to, to get there? It's probably not landing on our website the first time and converting. Every business is a little bit different, but I think that so many people avoid layering in either retargeting or push or email into mm -hmm. that. And like really understanding that like, you, you don't have to spend 80% of your budget on top of funnel activities. Like you want to clean that funnel, but if there's things that you can do to add retargeting, like you have to be realistic in, mm -hmm. in thinking about how a human being is going to actually make a purchase. Yeah. So we could do eight months on that. <laughs> and, uh, so th there's a few things and it's this fallacy that, um, and so many people that even I look up to have the wrong idea, which is if nobody's getting to the website, then it's a problem with the ads. But if they're getting to the website and they're not buying, then it's a problem with the website. Maybe. And I would say that if you are running radio ads and you convince them that they need this product and then they go to the website. If that's the case, then yes, it could be a problem with the website because you just generated all this desire. They physically typed in the address and then hit enter and then still didn't buy. If that's the case, then it could be a problem with the website or the app. But if you put it in a news feed or just an ad online where it's easy for anybody to click, that means nothing. Where an install is the first step and it's something that we talked about with with rally and we we came up with this whole maxim that was what if the install was the last thing someone did before they invested and if you think about it that way how, how does that change the way you would talk to these customers or these prospects it's don't just get them into the app and then the app's going to do the work because yeah. it's as marketers, we have so little control over these apps anyways, is these product guys just hold on to these things. We're going to build all these features that we like. And so, so even if you do have a good onboarding flow, it's still just like that hand holding thing and they want to be able to explore it on their own. So if it's too direct and just two one by one, people are going to bail anyways. So one more example would be, I sell a lot of stuff. I, I do a lot of campaigns for e-commerce and a couple of them are also on Amazon. And so if you don't think that someone is going to see your ad, go to your site that's on Shopify or WooCommerce or BigCommerce or wherever you are, and then they're not going to close out Facebook and go to Amazon to see if it's on there. If you don't think that's going to happen, you're nuts. And if you're not expecting them to do their research and read the reviews, then you're nuts. And if you don't think that they're going to compare prices and shipping options on both sides, you're nuts. And if you don't test those things and figure out where you need to put certain information to let them find and find these little Easter eggs that you put all over the internet, then you're not doing it right. It's this whole, uh, it's this whole world that you have to fabricate for them to search for. You have to know what their psychology is. Oh, I'm going to look at this. Do they have videos on YouTube? Are there any, do have, has, has anybody done these reviews? I don't know who these people are that spend hours reviewing all these products. <laughs> Some of them make a lot of money. Some of them make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, I think, okay, yeah. So, but they're going to go there and they're going to go see if there's reviews of your product. So maybe you put some videos up there. The, the, yeah. the biggest issue with that is a lot of people struggle to get this content because it's a lot of work to make that stuff. But if you invest in that and let them find it, then it just gives them even more reasons. You can sell them because a lot of people run the same ad in acquisition. They run the same ad in retargeting. And they just think, oh, maybe I just need to remind them. No, they're, they're, they're not done yet. But th that was all just a few tangents there. But I would say that, uh, what was the question? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, well, I I'll make a point to there. Uh, so, so first off, I've been in, uh, I don't know if I'm, if I'm the only one that's struggling with this right now. I'm home a lot more than I would be normally. And so I'm, 
I'm spending a lot more time like bored, like wanting to buy things. And so I've had this thing in the past couple of weeks that I really want an iPad Pro. And I'm, and I'm like, I'm going on YouTube and I love watching the reviews of the iPad Pro. And these guys, they take these amazing, sexy videos, right? Mm -hmm. What I've realized is that every single one of those reviews is sponsored by a company called Paperlike, which makes a screen protector for the iPad Pro that allows you to write on it like, and it feels like paper. Hmm. And I thought to myself, that's so smart. This company knew like more people are going to purchase an iPad from reading, watching a YouTube review than going straight to the Apple website. I'm going to reach out to these, uh, these YouTubers that get millions of views. I'm going to offer them affiliate, whatever. And I'm sure that they're selling a bunch of those screen protectors because it's the first thing. Here's an iPad review video. This is sponsored by this iPad product. Mm -hmm. Like it's genius. Yeah. So it's, it's just being where your customers are going to look. And so um, the biggest thing is that, you know, a lot of people run these acquisition campaigns and they just expect the website to do the work, but it doesn't work that way. You have to really tell the whole story. Some of these things, if you're buying a pack of gum, check out at the grocery store, no thought. But for some reason, buying things online, people will spend 45 minutes researching something that costs yeah. 10 minutes. They're still going to buy it, but they're going to do research on it. Like they're, it's not that it's a threshold of, you know, if I get enough information, then I'm going to buy it. If it, if I'm persuaded, it's, it's part of the process that people like to enjoy of looking and researching. The problem is, is if sure. they do the researching and they find other similar products with more information, that's when you can lose the sale a lot of times. But if you have something unique and you have all these assets and all these things, then it just, it gives them stuff to chew through. You got to give them something mm -hmm. to do so they can really, you know, because you can order something on Amazon, but it takes a lot of the, the fun out of it unless you can give them more things to play with. Part of it is it's the journey rather than the destination with a lot of these things, I think. And that's what we learned when we were working on these projects at Rally was, is it that they want to invest and make money on this Ferrari that they're going to buy a couple of shares in? Or is it that they've, they, they had this Ferrari poster on their wall when they were younger and you show them this and you talk about how they calculated the curves of the 61 Jaguar E type with all these weird things. And this was everybody's favorite car and, you know, all these great shots of it to get the real emotional appeal of it. And it was, we would spend a lot of money on acquisition and some of these people would invest on their own. And it was, if, you, if you're if you into the whole crossing the chasm thing of the life cycle of a customer or whatever it is, you know, early adopters, uh, you know, the innovators and the early adopters and the late majority and all that stuff. Uh, some of the people are going to do it because you don't need to explain it to them because they're just going to try everything. You know, people do that with food and then there'll be laggards when it comes to tech. Or they'll do that with fashion and they'll be laggards when it comes to tech. Or tech people, are they move first, but they're laggards when it comes to fashion or anything. That's why all those dorks, they all just wear the same hoodie and, you know, their you know, jeans with stains on them. So, <laughs> um, but for most people, if you want to scale, you have to think about that. You have to think about the whole piece because just because you're driving a lot of people and your, your costs are going up. Of course, your costs are going up because the people you're selling to need more from you before they're going to do it. And uh, a good example of that was we, I used to run campaigns for, it was the, uh, it was for this company. It was, it, it was a big company in the U.S. and they had a, uh, they had an Australian version of that. We were running that there. Australia uh, is one tenth of the size roughly as the United States and their budgets were big. So that means it was basically like adding another zero to the budgets. So if they were spending a thousand bucks a day as a test, it was $10,000 a day. And if they yep. were spending, you know, so it was a lot. And if you look over the past couple of months, you look at the reach and frequency of the people that you're hitting and you're hitting the entire population most, you know, almost the entire population of Australia, and you're sitting there trying to test new audiences. Wrong. You, you, you hit them all. 
So what do you do? A, a good exercise would be that if you have already hit everybody and, peop- and your costs are going up, guess what? You have to do something else to sell these people on these things, you know, like the sham wow. Everybody knows the sham wow. It's not like they're going to go find other people that haven't bought the sham wow. But just because they've heard of it and they've seen it a couple of times doesn't mean anything. A lot of times they need 10, 15 exposures to something before they buy it. So maybe you just need a higher frequency. But if you're the sham wow, then maybe you need to show them what it does. That was like those old infomercials, like the, you know, the Ginsu knife, you know, it slices, it dices, it julienne fries, you know, it does all these different things. And so you just have to work on the right combination. Yeah, I think, uh, no, no, I was going to say, I think uh, it's obviously different for different verticals compared, depending on what your sales cycle is. But I think a good exercise for people to think about would be kind of break down your sales cycle, your customer journey and the length of it. Think about how many touch points you're going to need to sell them and be like realistic. Don't just say one, seven, 10, 20. And then think about like, what's the breakdown of digestible information for each one of those impressions rather than being lazy and be like, we're just going to create like two or three ads that say the same thing and then retarget them and just show them the same ads over and over. Um, All birds does that. Like next time you're, you're purchasing an e-commerce from an e-commerce site or any site, see how they retarget you and watch what their messaging is. If it's, it's the same, same ad over and over, like what yeah. the hell? Like I've already seen it. Uh, tell me something different. Um, yeah. I signed up, uh, there's this like breath, I'm really into meditation and stuff um, and like all types of personal development, but I can't, I visited this like breath work meditation site, right? I got retargeted from YouTube. I must've gotten like 30 ads in a two day period and it was the same ad this is why I created this meditation course. Mm-hmm. I don't care why you t- create it. Like, what are you doing for me? Um, yeah. so I think that there's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's everybody's favorite radio station, W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me radio? But uh, um, it, it's funny, like what, when you say that. So there's, there, there's two things. One, <clears throat> I used to work in an agency where we did a lot of creative. We would bang out two new ads for every client every single week. One would be an iteration to see if there was any more juice left in there we could squeeze out of it. And the other one was usually like a left field ad. Let's just try something completely different just to see if maybe we can just shake something loose. But um, that works for the acquisition side. You know, maybe these ads are for this person or maybe we should test this different value prop or maybe we should do this. But you can't just turn around and throw those in retargeting. If it's e-commerce, you might be able to. You can use some ads because some of the people added to cart and then their baby threw up on the ground and they couldn't check out. And so you throw them another <laughs> ad and they'll buy it again. Not that it's happening or anything. Has that but, happened? Uh, <laughs> but the other problem with that is, is that you, that can work and you can pick up some low hanging fruit, but that's for the amount of money that you're spending to drive people to a store. If you just, you know, like usually the best, uh, retargeting is people have been to the page in the last 14 days. You just run a little ad retargeting campaign. You can spend, you know, a few hundred bucks a week on it and it'll bring in purchases. It's great. But then most people just drop them after 15 days and all the way up to years later, they don't touch them again. And that's when, you know, it's the people aren't saying no in sales. We always said it was not yet. So, um, so we had to. Um, that, you know, there's just all these people that, that they're not sold yet on there. Right. So you have to um, just say more things to them. Uh, you have to say, oh, let's tell you the story about this. This is how you can use this. This is, you know, this is how everybody else uses this. This is, uh, you know, like certain testimonials. And so it was, I got re- I still get retargeted from this company that focuses on retargeting. Uh-huh. And uh, I get the same ad from them. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> retargeting is a retargeting company is terrible. So it doesn't, it's, it doesn't work that way. So you have to add a lot more content to it. Um, let's, uh, let's spend the final the past next couple of minutes, the last couple of minutes. And is that Cooper in the background? Do I hear? It's Cooper over there. Yeah. He's staring at me. He needs me. How old is he by the way now? He is eight months. Eight months. Wow. Mm-hmm. 
How's that been going in quarantine, by the way? Okay, you surviving? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, I, I need a break really quick. Okay, cool. We'll All pause. Right. Okay. Hang on. No problem. Yeah, I think he's doing that right now. Yeah, I can't see very well. Okay. Alright, I think we got five more minutes of him here. Well, I can use him. Um, can you wait five minutes? Yeah. It's gonna be eleven thirty two. Okay. Cool. Um, cool. So uh, last five minutes, I think we'll let's let's give some the the audience some specific examples of stuff that we've ran in the past. The first thing I want to talk about is the articles campaign. Um, so what, I, I'll let you I'll let you kind of pitch that and, and how that came to be. So uh, it was just a dumb idea that I thought we should test is we have all these earned media of Fox News writes an article about rally or MSNBC writes an article, or Hype Beast writes an article about it. And for those days, you could go into adjust and you would see the spikes of installs. And then it's over. And then it's like, well, that was awesome. Why can't we do that more? Why can't we yeah. have more of this? But the problem is, is that if you're running an install campaign, you can't drive somebody to a website. It will only let you send them to the app store. In fact, you can't, there's no URL you can even put in there. And if you're running a conversion campaign, then you could send them to these websites, but your pixel's not on there and you can't optimize for install. The other problem is, is that if you run those ads to that page and you just optimize for clicks, how do you know people did anything? You know, cause right. Uh, you know this is good as anybody. You run e-commerce or you run app install campaigns or whatever. Clickers click, video viewers video view, add to carters, add everything to cart, never purchase, and the only purchasers purchase. So if you're running e-commerce campaigns, you got to optimize to purchase. It's frustratingly simple. The whole optimization thing in there is you can't pick any other event. You can, You might be able to go up funnel a little bit to initiate checkout or something like that but you're not going to get a whole lot of those purchases when you switch it to purchase that's when you get them it's an easy button um but it's also kind of annoying at the same time but so with these campaigns where we were had these articles that we promoted what i did was i created some uh some people would read the article and in there in the article it would say rally road and in the underline, it was the link. And so some people would click on that. They'd go to the homepage. And if you go to the rally homepage, it says click to download. So right. I created a custom Facebook event and turned it into a custom conversion of people that would click the download button after they read the article, clicked on rally, and then click, click to download on the website. Uh, and I would optimize to that event for a conversion campaign. Um, and I started to notice that there was an uptick in organic conversions or organic installs in adjust. The, the funny thing is, is that I just showed them an ad, they clicked on it and then they installed it, but adjust still doesn't think it came from Facebook. They saw right. it as organic, which is silly. You know, I think every single time, you know, Mark Zuckerberg goes to Congress, it gets harder to track things. But yeah on that same token, if you can see that if you spend a bunch of money and you see a spike in organic conversions, then you know it works. But what I was starting to find out that <clears throat> it wasn't people that were, uh, that were clicking through that little funnel and optimizing for it. It was that they, because I also noticed that the number of searches, like if you go into the, uh, App Store Connect, you can see how many came from apps, how many were brand yeah. searches, how many was in the suggested thing. And so it was a lot of search results that were coming whenever I would do that. So what was happening was people were going through their newsfeed, they'd see the article, they'd click on it. Now they could have clicked on the link rally that was hidden in there, and then they yeah. could have clicked, clicked the download and it probably would have opened up the App Store. That would have happened, but that's not what they were doing because we were able to see that since the search volume was going up, they saw the article, they read who knows how much, they closed Facebook, they went to the app store, typed in Rally, and installed it that way. 
That's their idea. So the conversion rate was great. The cost per install when we ran that was a third of the cost as it was to run an install campaign. So it was amazing that we were able to do that. The problem was, is because we were actually optimizing, we told Facebook that we were optimizing for this custom conversion event, which was click to download, sure. that a few people were doing. It was enough to drive the campaign in the right direction because we were also experimenting when we created the custom conversions of trying, like, because you can pick different, like, categories of the custom conversion, like registration complete, trial started, purchase, mm -hmm. lead, whatever. And so I tested a whole bunch of the same custom conversion event. And I just said, okay, we're, we're going to leverage the same trigger, but it was, we're going to label this one as registration complete versus trial. And registration complete was the best one in terms of cost per uh, install, because you can actually see there were a few installs that were attributed back to the Facebook campaign. But the problem was, is because we gave Facebook a North Star, it would get us close to the right direction. If you optimize for click, you just go this way. But we gave it this custom conversion that was a North Star. The problem was, is if you gave it more budget to optimize to that, it actually goes towards that star. And those people were few and far between that were actually installing the thing. So what we needed was people that actually installed the thing, but you still can't optimize for an app install and a conversion campaign. So the one thing that we never got to do was <laughs> put the Facebook pixel in the app as like a, you know, a web iframe or something like that. That way you could op optimize for first app open or something like that to the Facebook pixel. And we could have scaled that thing. I think the, the, the biggest learning from that for anybody listening is just like to try things that don't scale and see what happens and just experiment, 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 and you'll never know what you'll find. Yeah, and then if you find something like that, just go to the, the, the product team and kick and scream and beg and plead for them to do one thing that might actually help for marketing. <laughs> they probably still won't do it. <laughs> I think that's a good uh, place to, uh, to stop, uh, Tyler. Uh, thank you so much, and um, yeah, stay safe in LA. Uh, for yeah, sure. all right, man. Let's do this again soon. All right, Tyler, bye. Later.